Good. Looks good. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so, welcome to our next class in the reinforcement learning course. As announced, we had to switch uh, exercise and lectures today, so that's why I'm here a little bit later today. Uh, today, next week, we will go back to the normal schedule. So, today, we're going to extend our uh, model free reinforcement learning toolbox, which we have started to fill in last week with Monte Carlo methods. And today, we are going to at, I would say, like a natural successor in terms of learning, which we will call temporal difference learning. So temporal difference learning is, um, in that sense, somehow familiar um, for, uh, um, in comparison to Monte Carlo, in that sense that we will also learn from experience, so from data. Uh, and it will also utilize the scheme which we had previously discussed, which is dynamic programming, where we utilize this dynamic programming approach to MDPs, so that we say, okay, we had a knowledge about the dynamics of the system, and we know that how the states are interconnected, why are actions and rewards, and so on, and we had used that basically to do like this full width backup. And TD learning uh, will basically do both things together. It will utilize this idea of sampling from experiences from Monte Carlo and using the idea just the idea, the concept of MDPs in the background without the real knowledge of the MDP itself. So it uses a structural knowledge, but not the specific knowledge about a specific system. So that's why it's still a model-free method which can be utilized just based on data. Um, therefore, it lowers model-free prediction and control. So we will basically again today see these two elements, prediction, we have a policy and we want to evaluate action values and state action values, and control. Um, it will do updates in an online fashion, so that is a big difference basically to Monte Carlo learning, or another big difference, that we are not uh, required to wait until the end of the episode, right? So with Monte Carlo learning last week, we had this requirement that the episode would need to come to an end, such that we can estimate the full length return until the end of the episode and then basically use this information to update our estimates on the state values or state action value estimates. TD learning will not require this. We will see in just a few seconds that it will be able to learn from a step-to-step -step fashion and not for an episode-to-episode -episode fashion as Monte Carlo. Therefore, it becomes a little bit more flexible. And we are still in the finite MDP case, so of the usual case uh, which we still utilized from second lecture or even first lecture partly, that we only have finite set in action. Okay, with this little pre-work uh, we will do a split of the um, lecture in basically four parts. We will first discuss prediction as our standard entry problem, so policy is given and we want to evaluate how good or how bad this given policy is. Then we will do uh, on-policy and off-policy control, which is abbreviated as ZARSA or Q-learning. And then we will discuss a little bit the so-called maximization bias, which is a problem uh, of any, I would say, um, reinforcement learning algorithm, which tries to find an optimal control policy. Uh, and we will see um, where the problem comes from, how we potentially can mitigate the problem to a certain extent. And the interesting thing is that this maximization bias problem, which we will explain using the example of Q-learning, is basically a standard problem which can be um, found also in many deep reinforcement learning techniques. So we will introduce it here today, but it is basically of universal um, usefulness. Okay, but let's start with the simple case, temporal difference prediction. So for Monte Carlo, uh, what we have basically learned last week, that's just a little recap to get started. So for Monte Carlo learning, we had basically learned that if we are in a certain state xk, we wait until the end of the episode, and we observe the return gk starting from this state, so until the episode is terminated, and then we compare the sampled return, wire or minus, the estimated state value for the state. And if there's any difference, 
then we utilize this difference in order to update our current state value estimate and do this update step. And for non-stationary problems, we have implemented here this factor alpha, which is basically something like a forgetting factor or step size, right? So our target here was basically the so-called episodic uh, return, which we have sampled after the full episode has come to an end. PD basically looks more or less the same, just with a slight different um, target. So the update rule for temporal difference learning looks very similar, right? The only difference now is that here, our target, which in the Monte Carlo case was the sampled return after the entire episode, becomes now basically the state value of the successor state, right? So, or not of the, yeah, of using the successor state, basically applying our standard MDP one step ahead prediction, right? So this is basically the same information as the state value using the MDP formulation, right? So here is the structural MDP knowledge, which we implement. And we utilize this bootstrapping, right? So we update in state estimate based on another estimate, here particular of the successor state, right? So that is more or less exactly the same what we did in dynamic programming, where we have utilized the model knowledge. Here, it can be done model-free, because if you look here on the right-hand side of this update equation, these are all just estimates, right? So this is an estimate we save in software, this is an estimate which we save in software. This is an estimate which we save in our software. And the only uh, other information is, are here two scalar parameters, the gamma and the alpha. So these are also known quantities. And the only thing which we get basically as data information is the reward, which we directly observe from the environment feedback. And this is basically our data point, right? And of course, we also need the successor state information, which we also obtained from our MDP directly. So therefore, this entire update equation here is perfectly data-driven. We do not need to utilize any model knowledge. We just use this MDP structural knowledge in our background, but without the requirement of having the specific values of the MDP model, okay? Um, and therefore, it is basically very similar to what we have introduced last week. The only thing is now that we use as a target the bootstrap target of the state value estimate using this MDP structural knowledge. And we have to wait, of course, uh, not until the end of the episode, but we need to wait at least one time step, right? Because we need to wait until the successor state has been reached. So the successor state, we can then look into our state value estimate table to find the V hat and then do the TD zero update. Next week, we. Yes. Yes. So, right, so these V hats, these three, this is basically a single table, right? So, let's say you have um, a very simple MDP with 10 states. So, then you would have like 10 state value estimates, right? So, basically, a table with 10 entries. And these 10 entries are the same for this V hat for this we had, and for this we had, and that x as a state would basically just give you the information on which element of this table you would access it, right? So this xk plus one would be potentially another entry of the same table as uh, the vxk, okay? So therefore, it is known as an estimate. Okay, and that's basically already the entire magic about TD. So, uh, we would see that most things which we have introduced last week with slight changes, but very mild changes, is basically like Monte Carlo. And the only difference is now that we have changed our target here, our target of this update equation, right? And target in that sense that um, if we compare the content of the square bracket, that this is like our sampled data value, here it is basically also our bootstrap data sample value, and we want that our state value estimate becomes as close as possible as this left-hand side of the bracket equation, so that's why we call this our target, 
in the sense of supervised machine learning. So basically, same wording here. Okay. So basically, yeah, we will see that all about today is basically just exchanging this GK with this bootstrapped target, which is also called the TD target. The prediction algorithm for simple difference learning is therefore also very simple. Um, we just need a policy which needs to be evaluated, policy pi, some state value estimates uh, as initial values would be also fine. And then basically we just apply the actions from the policy which we want to evaluate. We observe the successor state and the reward value which we need in order to formulate the TD target. And we do the update step from the previous slide and we do it all over again. And in context, in contrast to Monte Carlo learning, we do this now for every time step, right? So therefore, this prediction algorithm can be also applied to continuous problems, which are not ending, right? So which are, let's say, going through for very long amount of times. Like if you're starting to operate a chemical production plant, which operate normally really for months and years, because they are very expensive if you start them from scratch and you really want to have a high throughput. So in chemical industry, these processing units, they really run for a long time and therefore you would not have something like episodic uh, environments. But here in this case, we could also apply this because we just have to wait for the next time step. Okay. Then what we can basically do is we can compare a little bit the, um, let's say, characteristics of temporal difference learning and Monte Carlo learning, right? So Monte Carlo learning we have introduced last week and today we introduce already TD learning. And I would like to um, see a little bit where are the similarities and where are further differences. Why is that interesting? Because it's basically interesting that they use more or less the same data, right? So TD and Monte Carlo use the same data, so sample updates, but they use it in a little bit different way. And in order to do so, what we can introduce is the TD error, which is basically have been already introduced on the previous slide. This is now just the content of the square bracket, right? So line 5.3 is exactly this content here, right? So just without the brackets and all the other stuff. And we introduce this as the TD error with the uh, Latin, uh, it was the Greek sign delta here. And um, this delta basically tells us how far away our current state value estimates are from the data which we have obtained here in terms of the reward. And our goal, of course, is that over time, when we obtain more and more data, that this arrow, the delta, goes to zero, right? Because if that goes to zero for many, many subsequent data samples, that would mean that our inexpectation that our estimator is precise, right? If that is zero, then basically this difference of the discounted state value estimates would correspond to the sampled reward which you get from the MDP, and that would mean, okay, these estimators here behind seem to be accurate. And now I would like to compare or try to make a um, connection, basically, between this TD error, which we have introduced here, and the Monte Carlo learning process. Because we will see that there's an interesting, um, let's say, similarity or alignment to each other. For that, we basically do a little bit uh, of calculation, and we calculate the Monte Carlo error, and we assume that this Monte Carlo error here uh, on the left-hand side is given, and we are for uh, the right hand side, basically, what we can do here is we can just write down the um, um, yeah the MDP formulation using the uh, recursive implementation for um, v hat, right? So v hat would be r k plus one and plus gamma um, times v hat k one, and yeah, so basically just inserting our MDP formulation. Then this part here, the RK plus one, um, the, what is it, the minus VXK and the plus gamma 
vxk plus 1. That is exactly our td arrow. And the rest of the equation is this gamma times gk1 minus v hat. And this can be then re uh, uh, reapplied using the MDP formulation and again and again. And what we will basically find out is that under the assumption that the TD error is not changing over the course of an episode, that's a Monte Carlo error where we combine the state value estimate with the episodic return mm -hmm. is basically the same as the discounted sum of the TD errors. Okay? In the simplified case. Of course, if v hat is updated during an episode, which would be normally the case for dd0, because we have the opportunity to do so, then this um, equation here only holds approximately. But here we can also see again this similarity that basically when we update td many times during an episode, that this is basically updating with the errors over time being discounted, and this then basically leads to the same error if we would do a full Monte Carlo sweep. And this already gives us, let's say, a certain, a certain certainty that TD0 updates will also converge to the same in expectation if we would have enough samples or infinitely many samples to the same estimation values as Monte Carlo learning. Right? So in steady state, both estimators will reach the same state value estimates, which we can, as I said, also draw from this equation. If we put in Monte Carlo and temporal difference learning in a, let's say, a landscape of reinforcement learning methods in terms of the width of the update and the length of the update, it is basically the shortest kind of how we process the data. Here on the left hand side, with the exhaustive search or brute force approach and dynamic programming, these are basically the two model based variants which we have introduced. And in these two model based variants, what we have done is using the model, we have updated the entire state value estimates, we have updated the entire control or prediction estimates or policies in a full width backup, right? So during one full sweep, using this model knowledge, we have basically updated everything once. Here, with temporal difference learning, that would be basically the uh, complete opposite in that sense, that we have only updated one state value estimate in one time step, right, in one iteration, because we just look, okay, what is the TD error from one time step to the another, and then we update the state value estimate of this one single state, and Monte Carlo would be, of course, a little bit longer in that sense that we can update along the states which have been visited during the episode. But we do not update anything which is left or right uh, from the visited states. Only if a state has been visited during an episode, its state value estimate will be updated. Okay? So in that sense, width of the backup, which here is an extreme case, converges or is represented by the model-based solution, and here the length of the uh, backup, which basically means that we only update one time, uh, one um, state, and here we can update the states along the visited state directory. Okay? We will see also in the next couple of lectures that uh, we will introduce some variants to the learning concepts, which we have already introduced, which will be not um, any of these four extreme cases, right? So basically what we have learned so far are the four extreme cases of this landscape. And what we're going to introduce are also intermediate cases because as intuition t tells us, extreme solutions normally are not always the best solution in that sense that many problems require good compromises. And we will see that in the subsequent lecture, we will also able to introduce such compromises which are in between, for example, Monte Carlo and Temple Difference Learning. But that will be done then next week. Here's also from the Sutton and Bartow book, I think a very nice um, figure or example uh, just to 
remember basically as a graphical hint or a graphical uh, remark this difference between how and when we update our estimates uh, in terms of state value prediction. Uh, the background here basically of the problem which is illustrated by this figure is basically the following that you leave office um, and you have like an estimation problem in that sense that you would like to estimate when you will arrive with your car at home, right? So you have knowledge about driving a specific route from office to home uh, based on previous experience and um, during your next ride with your car you want of course to update your estimates about when do you think you get uh, at home and in the Monte Carlo case what will happen is that basically you will update all your state value estimates here on the left hand side would be the estimated uh, total travel time that these estimations, which uh, seem to be wrong, especially at the beginning, so when you left the office, you obviously thought that you will make it in 30 minutes, but actually you have made it like in 42 or something minutes, so you needed to update, you needed to correct those estimates, like with this little step size correction which we have seen, but you do these updates only at the very end, right? So you wait until you are at home, have parked your car into the garage, and then you will update your prediction value here, basically saying, okay, obviously I was like a little bit wrong, so maybe I take, I don't know, 10% of this error, so this would be here our Monte Carlo error, right? And let's say we take 10% of it to update this estimate like a little bit up, right? So maybe next time when I do the same travel, maybe due to expectation, I think that my arrival time is like 32 minutes or something, okay? But you will do it after you have arrived at home. In TD learning, you would be even able to do similar things, but you can do it like online, right? So during your drive. So this would be basically something like uh, Google Maps is doing somehow under the hood that when you reach certain mile points and you see, okay, after leaving the office and reaching the car, obviously I was. I was for this lack of the route, I was already quite wrong, right? So my expectation was like 30 minutes, but when I am uh, basically at the point where I reached the car, I can already see, okay, there was, I don't know, some delay on the parking lot of the, of the office building or whatsoever, or delay on the, I don't know, corridors reaching your car or whatsoever, that um, this was already wrong, so you can already update this estimation value before you reach home and therefore this updated estimation value can then also be beneficial of updating the subsequent states, right? So that would be like online during the problem and Monte Carlo here on the left hand side basically offline just after you have reached the episode. So no new information here, just a illustrative figure to give you this idea again Monte Carlo versus TD where this big, big difference is between step-by-step -step learning and episodic learning. Speaking of examples, of course, we want to utilize our standard example also to have like a head-to-head -head comparison between the different methods. Our standard example was the first three MDP. And since we're doing prediction here so far, uh, we need a policy uh, to be evaluated. That's our 50-50 policy. And here, from our very first solution, we again see the state value estimate. Uh, not state value estimate, but the correct solution. So, 1.1 um, for the state value of the small state, 1.9 for the medium-sized tree, and 2.9 for the large-sized tree. And now we can apply, again, temporal difference learning to this very same problem. And what we can basically see here is uh, the three states first state, second state, third state, for three different step size, a very uh, large step size up here and a very low step size up down there. And what we can basically see from this example if you compare it with uh, Monte Carlo learning is that we will also see a more distinct uh, comparison on the next slide that it's very similar. So that is somehow to be expected, right? Because we still use a data-driven estimation technology, so to speak. So it's very similar. 
And also what we can see is that the step size really has an influence. If we take large steps at the beginning, we will see that the convergence rate here at the beginning of the correction of the state value estimates is much quicker, right? So we will reach the um, final values here, these dotted, not these uh, dashed lines are basically our true values, which we have seen also in the previous slide. Um, if I take smaller, much smaller here by a factor of four um, step size values, then I can see that the convergence rate is much slower. However, we trade this against uncertainty, that is again this blue shaded area here, which is basically one standard deviation around 2000 independent runs. So that means that this estimator will be somehow having a high variance. This estimator will have a low variance, but this above just takes longer. And this is, let's say, more certain in the steady state, right? So from this figure, I think we will also see similar figures in just a second. We can already see that a combination might be to start with very high step sizes at the beginning, right? So we want to converge like quick towards the final values. And then when we are in the area of the final values, we take smaller step sizes to not erratically move our state value estimates uh, too quickly, right? So start high and low, and that's basically something which some of you might know from similar things from supervised machine learning, which would be basically a stochastic gradient descent using momentum terms, like a very famous, famous ADEM optimizer basically worked like this figure uh, basically reduce um, the step size over time, of course, with some additional statistical evaluations under the hood, but the basic principle is very similar and easy. If you compare then the first three MDP against Monte Carlo, so um, the dashed lines here are the TD errors or the TD estimates. The uh, solid lines are the same values from Monte Carlo. And we can see here again the four step sizes and our metric, which I've basically put here on the left hand side, is the root mean square of all state value estimates against the true value, right? Of course, we have knowledge of the true value, so that's somehow like an academic example or an academic um, representation, because in reality, nobody will give you this value, right? So uh, if you have an unknown MDP, so you're operating in the dark, in the unknown, nobody will give you this value, right? So therefore, this kind of chart, this kind of figure is just for illustration purpose, nothing which you would build in a, in a true real-world application. But from this figure, we can basically learn that, as I've already mentioned on the previous slide, the characteristics between TD learning and Monte Carlo learning are very similar, right? because the update rule is more or less the same. The only difference is now that I need full episodes for MC, and for TD I can also do this sub-episodically during a step-to-step -step transition. But in terms of the um, learning here, it is very similar. Sometimes it is argued that TD learning is quicker um, due to the step size, step-by-step uh, -step learning, but we can see basically here, especially at the beginning, there's not a real big difference. And also, if I'm looking here at the end values, um, we can see that yeah, there is not such a big difference here. However, in average, I would argue that the Monte Carlo-based updates here are even a little bit more certain um, due to the fact that very likely will will not be required to do bootstrapping Bootstrapping normally also adds a little bit on to variance, uncertainty to the estimates because you need to update an estimate based on another estimate, which is not the case for Monte Carlo learning. However, bottom line here from these figures, as I said, is it's not a big, big difference between the two methods. Similar outcomes, similar characteristics, just a different target. Okay, then we have already spoken a little bit about the step size and the convergence of it. And one can show that um, TD0 will estimate to the true 
that will converge to the true state uh, value if uh, we have a constant but sufficiently small step size alpha and even with probability one if the step size holds following conditions. So if you add up the step sizes for all time steps, that could be unbounded. But if you add up the step sizes, square them and sum them up, this series would need to be bounded. And there's one specific series which meets this requirement, and that's the series 1 over k, right? So if you would put this 1 over k here, so you would basically add up 1 over k for infinitely many times, this would become infinitely large. If you update 1 over k square and sum it up, you will basically see that this is in finite value. Right? And this is basically this idea which I've already sketched uh, briefly on the previous slide, that you start with very high step sizes, right? So if you're on the first time step, k would be 1, so alpha would be like a full step, so to speak. If you're on the second step, that would be 1 half, and so on. So it would start with very large updates and then become eventually smaller and smaller over time. And of course, if you are like in the, I don't know, 1 millionth time step, this step size would be basically practically zero, one over one million. So that would basically mean that your estimation correction would be basically so infinitely small that your state value estimates come to a steady state, right? So the steps which you take will be so small that the state value estimates will be frozen. Yeah, often TD0 converges faster SMC, but there's no guarantee and the Forest tree MDP even gave us a, a contrary example that Monte Carlo was as fast as TD0. We will see in the uh, exercise next week where we will also compare TD against Monte Carlo, actually an example where this holds true. So where TD0 indeed is much faster than Monte Carlo. But as I've said, this is just uh, like an application kind of uh, characteristic and it cannot be shown like in general. It always depends on the application. What do you mean by policy steps? No, yeah, I mean... No, so here we are still in the in the prediction problem, right? So somebody gave you a policy, this policy pi, which is fixed, right? So this policy will dictate you what to do in any state, and it will also dictate you which states are to be visited, right? Um, if certain states are not visited using this policy, then you also do not need state values for these states because you will never meet them, right? So with exploration, what I think you're referring to will be discussed in the context of control. Okay. But other questions maybe at that point. No, not? Good. Okay. Um, so we have learned a little bit about the similarities. Uh, we have learned a little bit about the convergence properties of TD, like uh, how should we select the alpha um, to be converging towards the true values, uh, maybe very quick at the beginning and then slower at the end. And now I want to basically, for the last step here of the prediction part, I want to compare again TD0 and Monte Carlo, but now I would like to emphasize the specific difference between the two methods in the context of how we will interpret data which we obtain, especially when we do so-called batch learning or batch training. What I refer to this is that in reality, so this is actually a very practical problem, in reality the number of data samples, so each line here would be basically a data sample consisting out of uh, 
a full episode, right? So this would be like an episode of different uh, state action reward series until the episode has terminated. And we might have a couple of these episodes until that's it. Um, and of course, in reality, the number of steps we have and the number of episodes we have in total is limited, right? So in that sense, we will have, from practical point of view, a batch of data at the end, which we can maybe say like, this is the upper cap of data which we can hope to have at the end in order to do state value and action value prediction. And the question is now, if we take this data and throw it into Monte Carlo and throw it into TD0, how will the two estimator approaches interpret this data and how will their estimation outcomes be in that sense if it's similar or different, right? Because what we have discussed so far, especially here, is that we would have basically infinitely many steps, right? So if we have infinitely many steps, then TD converges to the same value as Monte Carlo, because Monte Carlo is also a true state value estimator. So both are consistent estimators, which will converge to the same true values. But what is if we do not let them converge until the very final end? So if data is limited, what is that? And that is basically this batch learning idea or batch training idea. So therefore, we process all episodes J from 1 to capital J. And uh, we want to see how this basically then behaves with Monte Carlo and TD. In order to do so, we will study a very simple example here from Barton and Sato, um, which is a two-state MDP, very simple. So we have a state A. Um, if you are in A, you will transit towards the second state called B with 100%, and uh, you will get a zero reward. And if you are in B, you basically will automatically transit to one of the two terminal states. So these uh, square rectangulars here are our terminal states. And you will basically transit with 75 probability to this upper one with a reward of 1, and 25% probability to the lower terminal state with reward 0. So that would be the MDP, right? That, that is our MDP. We could make a model out of that, but we do not do it. We will just sample data, right? The sample data is basically summarized here in this table. We have seven data samples where we have started in B and then basically just looked what happened from B on. B1 means that we have climbed up basically this upper route. Um, and B0 means that we have climbed down this lower route. In total, this is also well within our expectations, because two out of eight are going towards this lower route, which is 25%, and six out of eight go the upper route, which is also 75%, right? So the data is somehow consistent here with the MDP formulation. And we only have one sample, a single sample, which starts in A, and then according to the MDP formulation, we will get zero reward and end up in B, and then in this particular case, we are going down the route. And now what we're going to want, or what I would like to do with you, is I would like to take the data, the, this batch of data, and see what TD0 and Monte Carlo will give us for information regarding the state value estimates of the first state A, and the second state B, right? So we will utilize this data, our two methods, to get two state value estimates. Okay. In order to do so, um, we write down our update rules, right? So this is recap at this point, right? So this is our Monte Carlo update rule with the episodic return, and this is the TD update rule with the target using the bootstrapping approach. So, since we assume that we are in steady state, so if we do this with sufficiently small step sizes, that would mean that basically um, this TD error and the MC error would become zero, right? Would become zero in that sense 
that we will assume that we converge to the true values. So therefore, we can basically utilize the contents of these two square brackets and yeah, basically just re uh, write them down and rearrange them in such a sense that we can basically solve for v hat for the state value estimate, right? And since we do this not only for one episode, but up to capital J episodes, we basically write down this equation g minus v is zero, and zero is equal to this um, td target, or td error, not target, that is also zero for j episodes, right? So this equation is basically just from the assumption that we have reached the steady state, so that we have basically crunched the numbers many, many times, right? We would get this equation, as you can see, this is, those are independent of the alphas, so independent of the step size. So this would basically then represent the, the, the state of the estimators, the internal status of the estimators, F, as if you would have crunched those numbers with certain step size over and over again, right? So you, you take the batch of data, you throw it against the estimators, you update your estimator with a certain step size, you take the same data, throw it against the estimator rules again, you go, do a little step size and you do it again and again and again, and eventually you will find out that if you throw the data again against your estimators, that you will not move anymore because you have reached steady state, right? And in order to do this a little bit quicker, we just say, okay, in steady state, left-hand side will be zero because that will be then the steady state of the estimators given the data. So that's why these two equations are independent from alphas. Okay, so with these equations for steady state, we can now calculate the state value estimates for TD and Monte Carlo. And we will start with the second state, with the state B. Because here it's simple, um, if we are in state B, there's no successor state, right? So if we are in B, we will terminate after that, and the state value of a terminal state, so of these two guys here, is zero, because there are no further rewards which can be obtained afterward. So for B, this successor state value estimate is zero, right? So we can throw it away just for B, not for A, only for B. And if we do so, if we can, so here it has been already kicked out, out of the equation, then we see that the two equations basically become identical, right? If we kick that out, the two, the two equations are identical. And we can see now that for the B state, so for the terminal state, there's no difference, right? We just sum up the sampled episodic returns, average them, and that would be our state value estimate for state B, which is identical in both cases. Six over eight makes 0.75. That's nice. So in this sense, we can see that for the estimated return for the uh, second state, for the late state, we do not see any difference. Okay. But how is it about the first state? State A. Let's take our equations again, here for Monte Carlo, here for TD0. And now for TD0, this of course is not now zero, right? Because that would be the successor state would be state B now. So we need to take this into account. However, our MDP said that the reward from A to B is always zero. So we can basically ignore this error here for the moment. So that's why we do not see any error here, because we have only obtained zero rewards going from A to B. Okay. If you consider this, um, we can basically now see that in the Monte Carlo case, uh, the state value estimate for A is basically just the sum of the sampled returns. And for TD, it's a little bit different. It is basically the sum of the discounted state values of B. And here's the difference. <laughs> 
In the Monte Carlo case, we have just sampled one episode where A was visited, and in this one episode, in this year, we had sampled by chance two zeros. So we went from here to there. And therefore, this was zero, capital J would be a one, and the estimate for V hat for A in the Monte Carlo case would be just a zero. Because we have one data sample which we can utilize, and the data sample for the episodic return in this case was zero, and that's it. In the CD0 case, we can of course take the equation, solve for V at A, so put this on the other side, and what comes out is that VA is basically gamma times VB, uh, I think gamma we have just set to 1 for sake of simplicity, uh, but doesn't matter. VB was definitely 3 over 4, um, so that's a completely different value, right? So here we have a 0, and here we have a 3 over 4. Does somebody have an idea how can we explain this difference? So we have same data, right? The data for the two are the identical, sampled from the same MDP, but in on the one case we get a zero, and in on the one case we get three over four. Sure. Yes, that definitely goes into the right direction. So we only see one data sample for the, for the Monte Carlo case, but what's about the TD case? So does it also only get one data sample? It's bootstrapping, absolutely. So that's a big difference. The Monte Carlo updates, can, the state value A can be only updated in this case where we visit A, right? And as this was only done once, we have sampled to zero here and that's it. In the TD case, we bootstrap, so that means we, make, util, we may utilize our knowledge about the MDP structure, so we know that after A, there comes B, and since the reward here for the sake of simplicity could be dropped, this is basically the same as the discounted state value of the successor state according to the Bellman equation, right? So this is basically the applied Bellman equation, neglecting that there are no rewards from A to B, right? And therefore, in other words, indirectly, the TD estimator could make use of the knowledge of the data samples of the successor state, so of the state which comes afterwards. And therefore, this knowledge could be utilized in order to update this in a different way in contrast to Monte Carlo. And actually, that is a structural difference between the two. Monte Carlo, that is what basically Jaron said, Monte Carlo just takes the data which we have for the episodic return, and we try to fit in steady state the state value estimate that with respect to the sampled return, episodic return, that the least squares error, so this least squares error here becomes minimal, right? This fits to this example because we have just one data sample which says it's zero. So therefore, if we want to minimize the least squares error, our estimate must be also zero because then the least squares estimate between the sample data and the estimated data becomes zero. TD is a little bit different because it utilizes that what uh, Jura said it basically utilizes this knowledge, this bootstrapping about the MDP structure, and this is something which in estimation theory we call maximum likelihood estimation. So it basically makes use out of the knowledge that we know that the MDP has a certain structure without the knowledge of the MDP itself. So it is basically absolutely certain that its internal model structure regarding the state 
a description, reward description, action description by an MDP problem is certain, and therefore it will basically try to minimize the TD error or the estimation error in maximum likelihood sense. And that's why we have this difference between Monte Carlo learning and TD uh, learning in this steady state regime using limited data. Right? So if we would if we would have done this infinitely many times, right? So not only eight times, but eight hundred thousand times, actually the two would have come to the same end, right? Because we would have so much data that utilizing uh, the standard update equations which we have introduced, that those will come to the same conclusion. But if we have this limited data, then things look a little bit different. Yeah, and we call this the centurity equivalence, which is basically simplified words is it does bootstrapping and therefore applies this MDP knowledge under the hood. And that's basically the second big difference between Monte Carlo and TD, which is summarized here on the slide, that if we have limited data and we want to squeeze out the maximum information out of this data, by reiterating over the entire batch of data again and again and again and again until we find out that the state value estimates do not change anymore, that in this case we will come actually to different results. Because Monte Carlo is something like a least squares estimator and TD is a maximum likelihood estimator. So if you have heard something about uh, estimation from other types of subjects, I hope you will I know a little bit from these terminologies what least squares and what the maximum likelihood estimators are. If not, there will be a new course in the winter term by Sebastian Peitz and me, which is um, machine learning for dynamic uh, system identification, uh, which we will launch in October. And feel free to visit it because we will also discuss a lot about um, least squares fitting and maximum likelihood fitting in the context of system identification, right? So this is the context of state value estimation, which is like a very special kind of system identification. But we will make use, utilize then similar techniques for identifying the dynamics of systems, right? So here we are estimating the state values of a certain policy, and you can utilize similar techniques in order to estimate the dynamics of the underlying MDP, right? Which you can then utilize with dynamic programming in order to solve for the same values. Okay, but this is more like an outlook. So as I said, basic takeaway message is different estimator properties, least squares, maximum likelihood, full stop. Okay, so we have therefore seen um, Many, diff uh, many similarities between Monte Carlo and TD, some distinct differences, so these are not identical methods for obvious reasons, but they are very closely related to each other. You will see more practical differences and um, commonalities during the next exercise, where you then will also compare Monte Carlo and TD learning. Okay, any questions before we move on to control? Okay, so the control part uh, is now very simple because everything what we have learned last week for Monte Carlo learning can be basically directly applied to TD. So normally, if I would be lazy, I would say, okay, the other three things you know, I go home, okay? Because you already know them and we will just basically recap and refresh them like a little bit in the terminology of TD but the basic concepts you're already familiar. So Zaza would be our on-policy learning algorithm and on-policy learning, you basically know the concept and that's GPI, generalized policy iteration. So we take a policy, we estimate the Q values of the policy, we do a greedy update step, we estimate the state values or action state values of the new policy and so on and so on until we eventually converge to the Final policy are not able to improve anymore and then utilizing the uh, policy improvement theorem, we know if there are no further changes between one greedy update step to the another, then we have reached the optimal policy. 
And we can basically do exactly the same now for TD, which is also known as an abbreviation, more or less like a, a helping abbreviation in order to remember Zazar um, in the same terminology as we already used it. So we update the state value estimates now using a bootstrapped target, right? So the bootstrap state action value target and Zarza basically just stands for state action rewards next state and next action evaluation, which is basically an acronym of this entire equation, right? So very simple, we take the state, the action, the reward, the next action uh, and state, and the evaluation. So Zarza therefore doesn't have any special meaning, it's more or less just, uh, just a helping phrase. So basically, therefore, GPI is we apply prediction here, right? So this is only the prediction step um, for the action value updates, as seen previously for the state value updates. And then we will do greedy policy evaluations or for exploration reasons, epsilon greedy policy evaluations. So that means after updating the state action values, we will do the update of the policy, and if we want to ensure sufficient exploration, we can do this in this epsilon greedy fashion. And that's it, right? So all building blocks, which we have seen here, are known. These are the TD updates, now applied to the Q values, not to the state values. And greedy policy updates, or epsilon greedy policy updates, we have already introduced with Monte Carlo. So these two building blocks together is Zaza control. So TD online learning using on policy updates. The rest is now straightforward. For sake of simplicity, the Zaza control algorithm, um, basically just the pseudo code from the previous slide. I will just quickly hop it over. Um, of course, since we have basically transferred everything from the Monte Carlo based on policy control from last week, uh, very two important properties hold the policy improvement theorem. I've already mentioned it a few seconds ago. So that means if you apply the SARSR just uh, long enough, you will actually converge to the optimal policy, assuming that you can steer your exploration sufficiently well. And also the Glee property, greedy in the limit with infinite exploration. So especially if um, you do your soft policy update steps using epsilon greedy and you start with very large epsilon so you do like a lot of random explorations and then you go down with epsilon so you become like more and more like deterministically less stochastically and then converge to a fixed policy and if you do this let's say theoretically infinitely long this was this glee theorem from last week then you will actually have found the optimal policy Okay, so nothing new here, so to speak. Um, big difference is, as I said, only the new target and that we are able to do this repeat loop now in a step-by-step um, -step way, right? So in Monte Carlo control on policy, we needed also to wait until the entire episode was ended. Then we could do the Q value updates. Now we can do these updates in a step-by-step -step fashion. If we apply a Zazar then for our first three MDP and you compare these slides um, with your printouts or on a tablet with the Monte Carlo kind of things, you will see that the, uh, that the curves look very familiar, uh, very uh, not identical, but very similar. Um, and of course, our main uh, target parameters or one of the main configuration parameters are here the step size alpha again so on how quick we basically want to update our q value estimates here for alpha zaza being 0.2 we have a quite quick initial conversions but also a very like uncertainty if you go down with this step size you will see that uh, yeah the initial learning here becomes a little bit smaller uh, but we will then basically reduce the uncertainty over time. And here with our 1 over j, 
or square root of j, this was um, the adaptive learning rate basically from last time. Uh, we can basically see that this is a very nice compromise, uh, which can also here apply to Zaza, so on policy control using TD, in order to find an optimal policy in a data driven fashion. Yeah. We see here also that in this example again, maybe to emphasize this uh, again, we see here, for example, for the state one, where the optimal policy, if we would use dynamic programming, would be actually to be in the waiting um, action, so to do not cut the forest trees. We can see here that the probability is not exactly one, it's a little bit below, and that is due to this epsilon greedy policies, right? So we are having an on policy controller here, so with uh, epsilon being 0.2, this is exactly this leeway which we need in order to ensure sufficient exploration, right? So what we could theoretically do now, I've uh, unfortunately not prepared a slide for this, but what we could do is, for example, the step size argument could be also plugged in adaptively here for the epsilon, that the updates for the step size and the updates for the exploration are both changed over time. We call, also call this a schedule sometimes, so we start with large steps and large exploration, move to smaller steps and smaller exploration. You can also find this in the literature as a schedule. But in general, as I've said, the differences to Monte Carlo here are basically just uh, limited to this step-by-step uh, -step, um, updates, which uh, in Monte Carlo case can be done only on the episodic case. Okay, any questions to Vasa? Right, so that was simple. Um, I can maybe spoiler a little bit that Zaza is also a classical starting algorithm for deep learning or deep reinforcement learning because we can see that the Zaza algorithm or the Zaza update rule for the Q values can be also implemented using large artificial neural networks or any other kind of function approximator without any big deal. Here we have discussed it for the simplified case of a tabular problem with finite MDPs, but you can also apply it to large MDPs using finite approxima uh, a continuous approximation. Okay, so this was on policy. So we do exploration using a stochastic policy, which is soft, which ensures that we will visit all state action combinations, right? So that we basically explore our entire problem space, so to speak. And now we will briefly discuss the off policy variant, which is Q learning. So where our actual exploration strategy done by a behavior policy can be different from the target policy, which we will learn from the data. And Q learning um, is even a little bit easier and therefore a little bit more used than Zaza, because Q-learning basically now combines the update of the Q-value estimates together with a greedy policy update, so to speak, in one, st in, uh, one step. And the big difference is only this max operator. So if you know the Zaza rule, well, state action reward next state next action, keep this in mind, and just put a max somewhere like in the middle, because then you will come to Q-learning, right? And the idea here with Q-learning is, okay, um, if I do greedy policy updates, and I want to find out my best possible actions leading to the highest possible Q-values, then using this MDP framework, when I transit to the next successor state, and I have multiple options available, so my actions, right? And I take this action, which leads to the best possible outcome. And this is represented just by this max operator here, that if I transit to potential states, I should take this action, which will basically lead to the best possible next state, which has the best possible state value or state action value, right? So in Zaza, we basically needed this um, on policy update steps, and here it would be basically an off policy update because this max operator, max of qxk plus 1u, this is basically making an off 
policy. Because this max operator with respect to the action values doesn't need to fit to the actual policy which you are currently applying to your MDP, right? You can apply this entire chain of, of uh, updates, especially with the max operator, for any data which you can obtain from also some behavior policy which is not part of the target policy. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. So th this is basically this idea of dynamic programming or the principle of optimality from Belmont, right? So the idea is that we break down our problems into many subproblems and assume that uh, an optimal policy must be something like self-sufficient, right? And this is basically the self-sufficiency that we say, okay, like, whatever you do, like, next, and next, and next, and next, and next, that must be always, like, optimal, and optimal means here that from the limited amount of, of actions which we have available, take that action which leads to the highest Q value. And as this update rule is basically like a recursive equation, right? This applies then to all state action value pairs, and therefore basically try to find the best possible state action value combination for all state action values in your problem space. And that's super simple because um, you do not need to derive an on policy um, policy from this using additional exploration. But you can basically just, um, if you're in a state then, look again for the state value actions of all successor states or of all possible actions which you have available and then take the action which will lead to the highest Q value, right? So this is like an explicit control choice which you can then make. And if you have learned the Q values from Q learning sufficiently well, the target policy, which is represented by these Q hats here, will be optimal using the policy improvement theory. So that's, again, nothing new here, so to speak, uh, because the main outcome from last week is the same, that an off-policy learning exploration can come from somewhere else and the target policy, which I've learned, can be deterministic and therefore optimal. So some requirements uh, need to be fulfilled, however, which are also requirements which you more or less already know. Coverage, right, So because we have off-policy learning. So that means we must have some behavior policy B, so like some exploration policy, which will, will basically guide us through the entire state action value space and will obtain data from all state action combinations such that we can learn the Q values, the Q learning values, from all of these combinations. But this is, of course, something which you have already introduced last week. Therefore, the policy B, our behavior policy, must be a soft policy, meaning that we will able to reach the entire state action space, and we have called this an epsilon soft policy, for example, and, of course, Step size requirements must also apply uh, if we want to converge to the optimal values in the limit, right? So this convergence properties, which we have introduced for TD prediction, also holds here for TD control in the context of Q learning. If you do the pseudo algorithm printout, you can see that Q learning in terms of the number of lines which we need, control line, uh, pseudocode lines, has become even a little bit smaller than Zaza. That's the beauty of the algorithm, because what you basically just need to do is you need to do the greedy updates, and you have to have some behavior policy which can be either a completely different policy, like a trainer policy, so to speak, or it could be your greedy policy on top with some random exploration actions, but it is very simple and can be implemented in basically no time. 
And yeah. Also, what is nice here, due to this max operator, that in contrast to off-policy Monte Carlo control, we do not need to have this um, important sampling, right? So important sampling was basically this idea of rerouting the state values, right? So if you have a behavior policy which will visit a certain state action directory, uh, we will basically map the estimates which we get from there to our target policy. This is now not required in TD because we do these updates not on a complete episode, but on a step-by-step -step fashion, right? So that's a nice thing that due to the step-by-step -step fashion, we do not need to do important sampling, but we can just apply the max operator, these greedy choices on a step-by-step -step, uh, level, and therefore making important sampling not required anymore. That's very nice, uh, which was, from my point of view, the greatest drawback for Monte Carlo-based control. So I've also brought you another little example from Sutton and Bartow um, to compare Q-learning and Zaza with each other. And um, I would like to discuss with you why do we see this result here. So what is the task is basically you have a grid world example. So S would be our starting state and G would be our um, final state, our goal state. And our task is to basically build an algorithm which is able to find the best route from S to G by not falling into this cliff area, which is this gray area. If you would fall into the cliff, you would be retransferred to the starting state with a heavy negative penalty reward. Um, there's no discounting and epsilon for expiration is 0.1. And what we can basically find is that for every time step which you are in the environment, you get also a slight negative reward of minus one. So there would be basically a safe path and an optimal path. And the problem is that Zada behaves better than Qlary. So how can that be? And what policy performance is shown here particularly? Because somebody has an idea why we can see this outcome. You're right. It's more greedy, yes. Um, Zaza, of course, is also greedy with epsilon greedy, yes. And Jaren? No, okay. It's more greedy, yes. And okay, what is the problem with being more greedy? Yeah, you prioritize short-term gains over long-term gains, that's correct. But why is that then leading to this lower rewards, which will basically indicate that every now and then, Q-learning will fall into this cliff area? To be honest, also these two questions are also somehow linked with each other. It's a choice of U of K, yes. 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 But when do we tend to fall off? So what curve is actually shown here? The learning curve. That's, that's the thing, right? So this is the learning curve under active expiration for both. And under active expiration, Sasa is able, due to this on-policy learning, to find the safer route because it knows about its decision, right? So if it falls into the cliff, Next time it will remember, oh shit, that was not a good idea to stay too close to the cliff. So it can prevent this and can learn to go to the safe route. Q learning, due, due to the split between behavior policy and target policy, um, it will, of course, using this greedy choices, this max operator, will find actually the optimal path. But as this is training, so that means that the behavior policy will do random actions on top of it, every now and then it will do like an action going like one step down. And this will, of course, be uh, suboptimal. 
So if we would plot this curve again during this like some validation episode where active exploration is deactivated, we would actually see that uh, the Q learning uh, agent would have been successfully found the optimal path. But as long as we have uh, active exploration, then it's also like a little bit risky. Yes. Yes. So Sasa will not change because Zava had basically learned on policy, right? So it will stay with this safe parse because it basically directly knows about its own consequences. And Q-learning will learn this path if exploration is then deactivated. You have exploration on Sasa. Yeah, but of course, of course, it will change something, right? These are the deterministic curves. So Zaza will also like jitter around in training, right? So in training, we will see that Zaza is like uh, going up and down due to exploration around it. But in average, right, it will take the safer path because it knows if I'm here and I do one step down, or if I'm here and I'm doing two steps down, then that's it. So in training, yes, there will be also some exploration noise due to epsilon greedy. Uh, exploration on Zaza, but these curves are basically the average curves or the curves if you deactivate exploration manually. Okay. So therefore, like a slight excursion to safety, greediness and safety, um, and that exploration can be like risky. Okay. Any questions to Q-learning so far? Also here, my outlook is, I would like to give you already now. This equation is really one of the equations which you should take away from the today's lecture and from the entire lecture courses, because you will see that it is super important. You will see it many, many times in different variants throughout the entire lecture course. And also, spoiler alert, this equation can be also made deep reinforcement learning ready with no big fuss. Uh, and it can be, and is used actually also for many practical problems. So therefore, Q-learning is really one of the big, big standard algorithms in deep reinforcement learning. And we will see just in a few lectures that the basic idea here of tabular TD, uh, of tabular Q-learning, um, can be directly transferred to deep learning. So that's really also the beauty of the simple of this algorithm. Okay, then a very quick and short outlook, or not outlook, um, side topic, I would call it. Maximization bias, that is a problem, and double learning, that's a potential relief to it. So maximization bias, where does it come from? So all control algorithms, which we have basically seen last week and also today, Q-learning and Zaza, in any way they obtain a maximum operator in it, right? So Q-learning already during the update rule, and Zaza then when we do the GPI, the generalized policy iteration, after we have done a sweep through the um, Q-value space, we will do the policy update, and then there would be, of course, also max operators being applied. And the problem is, of course, that can lead to positive bias, because maximization over sampled values is basically estimating the best possible outcomes, right? So if you have sampled, um, let's say, a certain state trajectory using the same action two or three times, and you have a stochastic environment, then this can lead to some problems, right? So let's say, um, let's do a practical example. Um, so let's say you, you're driving like 200 kilometers per hour on the autobahn. And um, that's your state, so you're driving fast. And your action is like to even drive faster or to hold the speed, right? So faster or hold the speed. And let's say you have done this like two times. And in the two times, you have been lucky, right? You have driven then 250 and nothing happened. You have even arrived faster at your destination. 
So if you do like a max operation about the samples, um, and you have a third sample where you stood like um, slow, then of course, using the max operator, using this limited amount of data, will tell you, okay, let's always go for the fast route. Because using these three or two data samples, that would be the, the obviously best choice. However, of course, if you do the same many times afterwards, it could be that you stick to this policy that you will eventually do some crash or other critical maneuvers where you will get a, like a negative penalty for, maybe by the police. Um, and in this case, it will be hard to basically learn if you just see the data samples after once you have been biased towards, okay, driving fast seems to be a very good idea that driving slowly, you need to basically compensate for uh, a policy which was already drifting into the wrong direction, right? And this is basically the, the root cause of maximization bias, that if you have a limited amount of data, that using this max operator will be always like over-optimistic, right? It will always lead to, in the, in the short sense of the, of the minimum data you have, to the actions which seem to be overly optimistic. And that is also called the maximization bias. Um, besides the car example, um, I've also had a small example here taken from the lecture books. So consider a single state with multiple actions u, and the true state value action would be zero. But the sampled states are, of course, uncertain, but randomly distributed. So some of them are below zero, and some of them are um, above zero. So basically, what would that mean? So the true state of some x, some u, would be zero. And then you sample a little bit. Let's say you sample zero minus 0.5 and plus 0.5. If you would take the max operator out of this, what would be the outcome is that, of course, the max operator takes this one and thinks, OK, for this particular state action combination, just using three data samples, using the Q-learning max approach, or then the Zaza max approach for the policy, that the uh, best possible state action value for this, um, for this state action combination would be plus, five, five, plus 0.5 which would be, of course, wrong, because the exact optimal state value would be zero. However, due to this limited data, that would be basically in bias, which we lead. And this bias would be then just reduced over time if we add up more data samples and also applying the idea of MDPs and then trying to um, basically limit this outcome of the maximization bias. So that's basically the root cause. We are overly optimistic with respect to positive outcomes um, or vice versa. Maybe I go back to Q-learning. In the Q-learning case also, um, basically the greedy policy choices which are represented here by the max operator, are based on one single estimator. And the estimator for the Q values and the policy making estimator or the policy making algorithm itself, they are not separated from each other, right? So we have like one kind of mathematical value which has basically two meanings, estimation, and also control. And this can be also um, leading or an interpretation of this maximization bias. How can we try to compensate for this maximization bias? We can basically try to split up the estimation and the control problem into two estimators. So therefore, that is called double learning. So we divide our experience, so the data which we obtain from the MDP, into two sets. 
if we basically learn two Q value estimators, Q1 and Q2, such that we can utilize one for the state value estimates and a second one for the greedy optimization choices and therefore trying to basically distribute this uh, maximization bias into the two networks. And we assign now specific tasks to, two, to the two estimators. The first task for Q1 would be this control task, right? So we take Q1, we optimize over it, and the argument of this optimization would be the control action, right? So in this case, we have one specific algorithmic object, which is relevant for the controller decisions. And we take the second state value estimator, which is now just doing the state value estimation, right, Q2, which is here used for the greedy policy updates, so to speak, in that sense that here we would put in the U for the maximum uh, Q value, and there we basically combine the two. Having said that, we therefore have two distinct Q values for two distinct tasks. The one would be for control choices, the other one would be for state action value estimation. And by doing so, we can basically mitigate the maximization bias. The Q value or double Q learning algorithm would be basically more or less very similar uh, to the one which we have seen previously. The only thing is now that we have basically two of these networks and two of these, or not networks, two of these estimators, and with equal likelihood we will just update the one based on the uh, estimator from the other, or the other one based on the estimator of the other, right? So keep an eye on this equation. Here on the left-hand side we have Q1. Here we use as part of the target notation Q2, and here we want to update Q2, and here we use Q1 as the target value. What is the drawback of this um, double learning, trying to mitigate the maximization bias? The problem is, of course, that we have now basically the double memory demand, because this is a table which you need to store somewhere. This is a table which you need to store somewhere, so you have double the memory demand. As you only execute one of these two lines per iteration, the computational demand is normally the same. There's no difference. However, another drawback, of course, is that if you have a certain amount of data, so a certain amount of time steps, um, you need to distribute the data between the two estimators. So that means only 50% of the time you will update this guy, 50% of the time you will update this guy. So for 100% of the data, you will basically just have 50% of going down the route towards exact state value estimators. So therefore, double Q learning could be called data hungry. Just to, uh, as the last slide for today, to illustrate that based on an example from Bato and Sutton, um, what we can basically see here is a very simple MDP. Um, we have two states, A and B. Um, from A, we can basically go deterministically right or left. If you go right, you will get a zero reward and go to uh, the terminal state. And if we go left, um, we will have different outcomes. Uh, that will be basically a normal distribution with a standard deviation of one, but a mean of minus 0.1, so in expectation, going left would be not a good idea, right? Because in expectation, if you go left, your reward would be minus 0.1, which is, of course, worse than going right, where your reward is at least zero, right? So I hope that every one of you sees that the best possible action, if you are in A, would be to go right, right, in expectation. So, but Q learning, as discussed, if that guy goes one times left and draws some, some 
samples from here. Of course, some of these samples, as this is a, basically a bell curve in the reward domain, some of these samples will be positive, and Q-learning with this maximization operator will say, okay, great, there was a positive reward, so let's go left, uh, which is basically here this curve at the very beginning, and then just over time, when more and more samples are coming from the left-hand side, it will be able to mitigate this, but it takes some time, some episode, in order to converge slowly towards the optimal value. And WQ learning, as it basically splits up the information between these two estimators, is able to mitigate this at least uh, sufficiently well and can be uh, converging or can converge to the optimal decision, uh, which is here a cap of 5%, which we will need for epsilon greedy exploration to the right and the right right decision, so to speak. Okay, so that's basically just a cartoonish kind of a demonstration on the difference between Q learning and double learning. In practice, or also in the research world, we will see that double Q learning has brought uh, some attention um, since the maximization bias basically uh, was discussed very significantly in the literature over the last couple of years. However, the practical drawbacks uh, of Q learning, so having the need of more memory demand, being also potentially more data hungry, um, has basically not really put double Q learning f into the forefront. Very often, just normal Q learning is used because, in the end, if you have enough data and if this is not only data but also implementation speed you will see that normal Q learning will be also doing well, uh, especially since this is, of course, a very, let's say, fishy example in that sense, that the average is just like slightly worse than this one, and it has a very high variance in contrast to the mean negative reward. So the example here from uh, Sutton and Bato is a little bit fishy from my point of view, but it brings it to the point if you have a very stochastic environment that this maximization bias can be an issue, but as I said, it's a little bit fishy. Um, if you have no stochastic impacts in your environment, so if your reward and state transition distributions are fully deterministic, of course, there can be no overestimation, there can be no maximization bias, because everything what you see is fully deterministic, so take the maximum operator, you will be fine. So this problem here will be just for stochastic environments. Okay? Um, double Q learning as normal Q learning can be also found in deep learning uh, architectures right away. So we will maybe also see this later once again. Good. Any questions to the maximization bias? Seems not the case. Then let's finish for today. And I thank you for your attention and we will see us next Wednesday.